Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to Sports and Other But Sports with Kent Sterling for Tuesday, May 12th, 2020. Brought to you by the great people at Today's Dentistry. Dr. Mike O'Neill and his entire team, they are covered from head to toe in PPE. They want to keep you safe. They want to keep themselves safe. They want to help you live a better life through better dental health. They do it every single day. The first day that they were back open, I was first in line to get my teeth cleaned and examined. I felt plenty safe. I got to tell you the truth. Give them a call, 317 849 2933. Want to commemorate a couple of things before we get started today. Had my first meal outside the house in what, two months? Went to Wolfie's at Geist, had a breaded tenderloin. It was delicious. Sat there, watched the TVs just like I used to, talking to people. It was very, very social, very, very nice. They had the social distancing protocols that we need to stay safe. I loved it. It was great to finally get out of the house to eat. Also, 50 years ago today, you know what happened? Ernie Banks hit his 500th career home run. He did it off Pat Jarvis of the Atlanta Braves in a game that the Cubs won, I believe, 4-3 to three in extra innings. Ron Santo knocking in Don Kessinger with a winning run. Tying the game in the bottom of the ninth was Billy Williams with a solo shot off Hoyt Wilhelm. For God's sake, how about that for a memory? Ran home. I didn't get there in time. Ran home from school. Like I said, didn't get there in time to see Ernie hit his home run. But it was a hell of a game. Kenny Holtzman uh, through at least into the eighth. Really, really fun game to watch. I loved the Cubs back in 1970. It didn't go well for them in the end, but they were a fun team to watch. You knew the batting order before that game started. You had Kessinger, Beckert, uh, Williams, Sano, Banks, Hundley. Callison in 1970. You had you had a bunch of guys. You had Joe Pepitone, for God's sake, with, with the Cubs back then. And then a pitching staff with Fergie Jenkins and Bill Hands, the late Bill Hands, Kenny Holtzman, Milt Pappas back in 1970. You thought they had a chance. They started the season well. It didn't end so well for the Cubs. But on this day 50 years ago, it was all smiles as Ernie Banks hit his 500th home run. And it's kind of funny, the only other Cub to hit 500 home runs in his career for the team, uh, Sammy Sosa. I couldn't tell you the year Sammy Sosa hit his 500th home run. But with Ernie Banks, I can tell you the exact date. I can tell you who he hit it off. And I can tell you what happened in the game. Now, I, I guess that's the difference between a guy, you know, watching Sammy Sosa in adulthood and a guy watching Ernie Banks as a little bitty kid in Lake Bluff, Illinois. I want to talk about youth sports today. All right. Youth sports has kind of been put on hold. As we deal with this coronavirus thing, it's not safe to play youth sports, and so people aren't playing. And, and so kids are being robbed of the experience of, of, of playing youth sports because of the circumstances in which we live at this point. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it, and we shouldn't give guidance to the parents, right? For those parents going through youth sports, it's important that you understand what youth sports are and how they work. Because if you don't, you're going to make the same mistakes that I made. And it took me a while to learn exactly what this was all about and how to comport myself as a parent, not just to my own kid, but as the parent of a kid who is also a teammate of a bunch of other kids and the parent of a kid who is playing for a coach. There are things you need to do and there are things that you don't need to do as a parent of a kid immersed in that youth sports culture. My kid played baseball and basketball, traveled baseball and basketball, and he did it for years. And and so we got to know kind of how this works at at a reasonable level. And so I just want to share some of that wisdom with you if you would like to learn a few things. If you don't need to learn nothing, then you know what? Listen anyway and, and decide that I'm full of beans. And that you know more than I know. Uh, Here are the five tips for youth sports parents. Number five, stay off social media. All right? You can't control it, and it's only going to drive you nuts. So don't go on social media, not about your kid and your kid's exploits in youth sports. Don't do it. Never pick on other kids on uh, social media. Never talk crap about your coach or officials in social media. My advice, though, is to just stay off entirely and never, ever, ever, ever go to message boards that uh, discuss your kid or your kid's team or kids your uh, uh, your son or daughter are playing against. Just don't do it because it will drive you straight up crazy. 
Nobody sees your kid through your eyes. If you're a parent, you're going to see your kid as special. Even if your kid isn't special, maybe especially if your kid isn't special, you're going to see your kid as special, and you are flat out not going to understand others who do not see him or her as you do. Number four, and so it drives you nuts. Number four, one of the best lessons that uh, of sports is dealing with adversity. Don't shield your child from it or move him or her away from it. All right, unless it's crazy, unless it's like USA Gymnastics and, and that, that dodo up at Michigan State. You know, if you've got Dr. Larry Nasser as somebody who's, or somebody like him who's dealing with your kid, run from that place like it's burning, all right? That's not the kind of adversity I'm talking about. The adversity I'm talking about is like playing time, that kind of thing. You're not getting enough playing time or practices are a little bit miserable. They're not really your cup of tea. The kid needs to kind of migrate through that to find what he or she can tolerate. That's a good thing in the end for them to figure out and shielding them from it or saying, you know what, you got to quit the team because you didn't enjoy this one practice. You need to quit the team. That's not the way to deal with adversity. And your son or daughter gets a great opportunity in a controlled environment with youth youth sports to be able to deal with adversity. I recommend highly sticking it out. And So here's what happened with us. Our son is playing nine-year-old travel baseball for Hamilton Southeastern. And the experience is absolutely terrible. It's awful. The co- I was an assistant coach, and the head coach was a complete maniac. He dressed me down in front of the kids for me, trying to make the practices a little bit more fun, trying to get the shortstop and the third baseman to charge ground balls. All right, so I stood behind him, and if I got to the ball, I got a point. If they got to the ball, they got a point. Well, they were laughing, and we were having too much fun, so the coach told me to stop what I was doing. This is terrible. He had team meetings where all he did was yell at kids, nine-year-olds. This was awful, but here's what we did. Ryan stuck with it, and so did the other kids. They all stuck with it, and they stuck together. At the end of the season, some of the parents got together, and they decided to form a renegade team outside the purview of Hamilton Southeastern Youth Baseball. And it was a great experience because they had their head job of of having the kids enjoy themselves and having parents enjoy themselves. If you select your team, if you put together a team, I highly recommend the parents being a very high priority in who you select. The kids have got to have some competence in terms of sports. But if you select parents who are going to get along with one another, the kid is almost through osmosis going to have a really, really good time. And that Fisher's Marlins program was absolutely wonderful for the three years that Ryan played in it and the three years that it existed. It was phenomenal for Ryan, phenomenal for the kids, phenomenal for the parents. And it wouldn't have happened if Ryan had decided that he wanted to quit because this coach was a complete maniac. Number three, coaches will never see your child as you do. And they don't see other kids as their parents do either. And that's a good thing. All right, coaches in large part in youth sports, they're just doing their best. In a lot of cases, they're parents. In very few cases, are they paid So what are you worried about? They're just doing whatever they can to try to teach your kid a little bit of something about the game they're coaching, and then make sure that everybody plays a little bit and and make sure that people learn, that they laugh, that maybe they're good enough to win a little bit, help toward those kids winning. Coaches, you're not going to get John Wooden, all right? You're not going to get Tony La Russa. You're not going to get Joe Madden as a coach. You know, you're, you're not going to get Bill Belichick. What you're going to get is a well-meaning man or woman who doesn't know enough but is trying to do his or her best. That's what they're doing. And you being critical is completely absurd given that you're up in the stands and not coaching them yourself. If you don't have the time to, or the energy to coach your kid's team, don't be hypercritical of the people who are. Because they had the stones to stand up and say, yeah, I'll do it. 
I'll sacrifice my time. I'll put myself in the crosshairs of every parent of every kid that I'm coaching in this league. They've decided to do it. You've decided not to do it. My kid did some of that. My kid coached a little bit, just enough to find out that he didn't want to deal with parents because the parents were crazy. The parents of the kids that he coached were straight up nuts. And dealing with them, like they didn't know anything about basketball. Ryan played college basketball at Loyola of Chicago, for God's sake, and understands the game with some depth. And he understands people with a great deal of depth. But the parents, they weren't having it. They made it miserable for Ryan, so he stopped coaching. Good work, parents. That's one guy who could have had a positive impact on a bunch of kids, but it wasn't worth his time or effort because the parents were maniacs. Terrible. Number two, uh, referees are basically volunteers who work tournaments and leagues because they love the game and kids. And what do you do? You rag on them relentlessly throughout the game. You take out all your frustration on the referees and umpires constantly to the point where they say, you know what, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I going to show up, get paid 20 bucks for an hour and a half worth of work? I mean, I could work at a McDonald's and make more money than this. And I get yelled at constantly by a bunch of parents who don't know their ass from third base. Why am I doing this? Is it worth it? And in many cases, the answer is no. I saw in a youth basketball tournament up at the Fishers Fieldhouse, and this was like one of those Adidas gauntlet events. So these are high-end players, and they're playing in front of coaches, right? college coaches who can grant their dream by offering a scholarship. So there is some tension in the place, and there's no doubt about that. With the players and with the parents, there's tension. So a parent goes nuts on a referee. The referee's like, hey, you know what? I'm doing my best. The parent's not having it. Keeps coming at the official. The official finally says, I'm done. All right? This guy's got to be removed. Security comes up. They walk the guy to the door. The guy will not leave. Security doesn't have the stones to make the guy go. They call the cops. The guy sticks around. The referee will not officiate with that guy still in the building, and the guy won't leave. What the hell is the matter with these people? What are you doing? Let it go. Understand that really the best thing you can do for your kid, if your kid's playing youth sports, is drive. That's the best thing. That's your real function. Drive the kid to the tournament. Drive the kid to the gym. Drive the kid to the diamond. Drive the kid to the football field. Whatever. You, you're the driver. You really serve no other purpose. You certainly don't need to critique the kid. You certainly don't need to critique the coaches or the officials. So just stop. Take a deep breath and try to enjoy the experience because soon enough, it's all going to end and you're going to, you're, you're going to regret that you didn't enjoy it more. And that is going to be a tragedy. Number one. If you can't control yourself, don't come. Allow your child to enjoy and learn from the experience without being distracted by and disappointed in you. All right? So your kid, the last thing that your kid wants to hear is a bunch of harassment from the stands either toward him or her or toward the coach or toward officials. My God Almighty. That's not what the kid needs. And I'm speaking from experience there. When my son, this is when my son played college basketball, and the coach at Loyola was making serious money, and now he's the head coach at Buffalo, a guy named Jim Weitzel. And I, I wasn't having it. Like, we drove all the way from down here in Indianapolis up to Chicago to watch Ryan play because they were playing a Division three team over the holidays. And so we go up to watch them play. And it's a route. They're up like 82-41 with 12 and a half minutes left. And, and I finally had it. Like, wh- wh- what is going on? Why is Ryan, I mean, my God, I understand in a close game, if you don't want to trust a kid to get in, I totally understand. I, I get that. My expectation was that Ryan would not play on a normal night, or at least wouldn't play a lot. He got in quite a bit, but he wasn't going to play a bunch. I got it. But with 12 minutes left of a game where you are absolutely routing an opponent, what are your guys, your starters, going to get out of playing the final 12 minutes of this game? So I started yelling. 
and and I'm yelling things like, yeah, that a boy, coach. You got your foot on their throat now. That a boy, squeeze the life out of them. Humiliate these kids. Let's beat them by 80. And I won't let go. And, and guys on the bench, you can see them looking at their shoes. And some of them are laughing, but not all of them. And they shouldn't have been laughing. And finally, Ryan went in with about four minutes left. I didn't help the situation. And, and as was the case at the Genteel Center then, it, there were maybe, I don't know, 400 people there. So my voice carries. And there was no way you didn't know it was me. I'm like 12 rows behind the bench yelling, just yelling at Weitzel to put Ryan in the game and how he's going to humiliate the opponent. And it, it was just a complete mess. I would like to go back and undo that. I'd like to unring that bell, but you can't unring that bell. So now what do you do? You have to live with the knowledge that you're an absolute idiot in front of your kid, not just in front of your kid, but in front of his peers on that team, in front of students who are watching that game, in front of his uh, coaches, in front of the athletic director, in front of everybody tethered to that program, you're making yourself look like an ass and you're putting your kid in a position to be an apologist for your behavior. Don't do it. I've seen this at youth baseball games. This is literally, this wasn't even travel. A coach from the opposing team, and I won't mention his name, but I still remember it. He's, we're uh, playing against each other. Our kids are playing his kids. He, as my kid is pitching, my kid, not the kid on my team, not my son, he's having a little bit of trouble finding the, uh, finding the strike zone. So what's the opposing coach do? He doesn't stop at heckling. He runs behind the backstop and starts waving to distract my kid. And then he climbs up the backstop and starts rattling the fence. That's what he's doing. I don't know that he had the ability to understand that what he was doing was harmful and ridiculous and stupid. I have no idea. But I know that this is not an isolated event. This kind of thing happens, and it happens all the time. And if you're one of the parents who authors this level of stupidity in front of your kid and your kid's friends and your kid's friend's parents, shame on you. Stop that. Try to enjoy this because it should be enjoyed. When I was a kid, we had parents who would show up to soccer games or baseball games and they'd read books. They're just reading. That was great. You drove the kid. You're there to pick the kid up. And in the middle, you read a book and maybe you watch a little bit if your kid's hitting. That's fantastic. That's a perfect thing to do. Much better than being so keyed in that you cannot stop with the harassment and the yelling and the unpleasantness. Please allow your kids to enjoy the games that they are playing and allow them to fall in love with them. Don't force it. You know, don't, hey, off we, we're going to be your sixth birthday. We're going around trippers. You're going to learn how to hit. And learning how to hit means you're going to swing the bat 300 times a day and get blisters. And then you're going to get calloused up. And by the time you're eight, you're going to be able to swing 500 times a day. Don't be a lunatic. Don't be that guy. Because your kid, unless your kid's driving that train and demands, unless you've got to like, hey, hey you're swinging the bat too much or you're, you're way too many shots. All right, no more shooting for you. If you got a kid who just will not stay out of the gym or stay out of the cage, then you know what? Intercede a little bit and try to hit the brake for the kid. But other than that, let the kid drive the workout train. All right, let him or her make that decision and ask you, hey, can I, how can I get better? Well, you could hit extra if you want to get better. Oh, how do I do that? Well, we can go to round trippers. Would you like to? Yeah, I'd like to. Okay, then let's go. But it's, so as long as your kid is driving the work train, that's fine. But if if you are, if you got to drag your kid kicking and screaming up to round trippers to get some cuts or into a gym to get up some shots, 
At some point, the kid's going to become resentful, and that work that he's doing or she's doing isn't going to yield a positive result. It's just going to frustrate the kid, and that's not what you're looking to get out of it. Youth sports can be a beautiful thing. It can be a wonderful place where so many positive lessons are learned, All right, but it can also be a, a nightmare for parents. And if you can sidestep the landmines, and, and make sure that you're doing all you can to either extricate yourself from the experience so you don't cloud it for your kid or, you know, just give your kid a, a pat on the rump as he or she, you know, decides that they want to get more serious about it. That's a beautiful thing and that's a beautiful outcome. Um, if, at the end, at some point, you know what, even kids who play professionally, they're going to stop playing. And when they stop playing, they're going to have to rely upon the lessons that they learned as they played. And that's going to be what sustains them as adults and makes them more hireable than their peers, right? Because I'll tell you this, being somebody who's hired a lot of people, if somebody played college sports or high school sports, number one, it gave me something to talk to them about in the interviews. Number two, it meant to me that the odds were really, really good. They were going to understand what it was like to be coached and they were going to understand what it's like to be a part of a team and how everybody needs to function together in order to create a positive result for the company or the department. That's really, really important. So you can get a lot out of that youth sports experience, the high school sports experience, collegiate sports experience. If you never play professionally, you're going to get a lot out of it as long as, and by you, I mean your kid, as long as you allow them to and you don't enforce it, all right? Enforcing it, you're not going to get much out of that. So anyway, that's my little spiel on youth sports. And uh, you want to listen to it and you want to follow it, you go right ahead. Again, just to recap, stay off social media. Um, Dealing with adversity is a good thing. Don't shield your kid from it. Coaches are never going to see your kid as you do. Uh, Referees, they're volunteers who are trying to make make the game fair for the kids. And you holding them to an unfair standard is just silly. Venting toward them is moronic. And, and the top thing that you, you need to remember is that if you can't control yourself, don't come. It's that easy. Drop them off, pick them up. It's that easy. Or if you're a dad and the mom really doesn't care about sports, the mom can drive the kid and, and then pick the kid up. And, and so nobody really has to watch or pay attention. You know what? Your kid isn't going to enjoy it more because you're locked into it. So... There you go. Tomorrow morning, Breakfast with Kent, bright and early, 8 o'clock on Facebook Live, immediately thereafter on Twitter and Periscope. Um, is it around 11.30 tomorrow morning, another chapter of Oops. I believe it's the final chapter. It's the one chapter I haven't read, and it's about moving back to Indianapolis or moving back to Indiana because uh, I'd never lived here prior to that, moving back here from, uh, uh, from Chicago. And uh, how adventurous that was. And what a, really, in the end, a great decision that was for uh, me and my family. Because Chicago, let's face it, is a corrupt cesspool. And Indianapolis is really a pretty easy to navigate town with a bunch of nice people who aren't the greedy bloodsuckers that you've got in Chicago. You don't have to figure out how things work here. It works as it's supposed to. In Chicago, you got to, who's your alderman? Who do I pay to get this done? Who do I, how much money do I have to give this guy to get this? You got to figure all that stuff out in Chicago if you're not from there. And, and people in Indianapolis, every kid in Indianapolis who leaves college goes up to Chicago for like two years and then hightails it back here because Chicago is a really hard place to figure out unless you grew up there like I did. Even figuring it out, Hey, you know what? You, you can get tired of that stuff really, really quickly. Moving here was a great decision for us. We'll talk about that tomorrow at about 1130 again on Facebook Live and then on Periscope. All right. Have a great day. Get out. Enjoy a meal in a restaurant. Now that we are able to do exactly that, maintain social distancing. Sure. Be as safe as you can be. However, we got to get out and we got to live our lives because quarantining forever is not sustainable. So let's go.